This is your forum, your science-loving community, and it's enriched by your participation. If you have an idea you are passionate and knowledgeable about, or even just passionate about, we invite you to tell us about it and help us all learn something wonderful and new. So please come up and talk to us about ideas from there. Uh, thanks for having this two weeks ago. Scott uh, had to talk about uh, vision and color and so on while I was out riding in, uh, in my bicycle with my wife in, uh, in California. We were sampling the atmosphere, as I had talked about in Science Sunday before that, of uh, wine country in California. So we had a nice time. Um, the picture there is Healdsburg. People have been asking. We were down in uh, San Francisco for a few days, originally for the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which is a very important organization that we're a part of that uh, uh, emphasizes the separate uh, the division between uh, church and state. So uh, we actually saw Cecile Richards there, uh, the longtime head of Planned Parenthood, and she spoke wonderfully. Salman Rushdie, who's not only a very great writer, but an inspirational guy, and very funny, too. So we got to hear him. Uh, Jared Hoffman, who's a, a representative that just got reelected from California and part of a group that they just formed called the Free Thought Caucus in the House of Representatives, which is very interesting. They're up to actually double-digit members now in the, Freedom, or the Free Thought Caucus. So there's actually uh, uh, pretty interesting things there. We were out there through the election and we saw that actually eight scientists have been added to the House of Representatives in this past election. So there's one party that, uh, that somehow uh, got eight scientists involved in this, so I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, so then we went up to Healdsburg, just up uh, maybe 75 miles up the road a little bit. People asked how close that was to the fires and how the fires impacted us. And they were actually about five hours drive away from, from us up there. Uh, so not, not that close, but it actually started Thursday early, the night of Wednesday to Thursday morning. And within 18 hours, the smoke had come down the valley and impacted our, uh, our riding. A particular matter was such that they chased us all down in a van and found us, got us all to meet at uh, Cor Corbett uh, Winery, which people here maybe know makes the brewed champagne. And so it wasn't the worst place to have <laughs> so, uh, so we finished up there and then, and then uh, uh, I have some pictures I can show you on my, on my phone of how cloudy or smoky was the next day. There's actually a group that's planning on riding this past week, the week after we did that, and I think that they probably had some serious considerations. I don't want to take any more time. Thanks again. I think Scott led of what I heard was a very interesting conversation. We got kind of pushed out of here, I believe, at the end of the week. I was from California trying to negotiate some kind of settlement, and we think we've got it arranged that uh, we will have this until 11 o'clock from now on is the aim, so that um, people, you know, people give us the time to commiserate and talk and have a good time after, after we talk about science issues. So thanks very much for coming. I'm very happy to be back. And Scott wants to finish up his talk about vision and color in uh, seven, eight minutes, if that's possible. I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and then go on to the next topic as well, too. The other thing is uh, January 6th, you should put it on your calendar. We're going to have Rick Knight from the Citizens Climate League, who talked to us, uh, the, the, the largest turnout we ever had for Science Sunday, 104 people came to hear him talk. He's a very good speaker. January 6th, um, please come and hear him uh, speak about climate change. Uh, he does a very nice job. Uh, so that's January 6th. All right, thanks, guys. All right. Good morning, science lovers. All right, I'm going to try to get through uh, everything we covered in about 50 minutes last year, uh, last two weeks ago. Uh, try to get through that and finish it up in about seven minutes. So, uh, <clears throat> just going to blast through this refresher. We talked about sunlight, why the sky is blue and red. We talked about scattering of uh, sunlight, which is white light but the blue gets scattered out. Talk about how that was discovered by Isaac Newton. Um, Max Planck, a scientist
point that's about 1900, figured out how it is that hot things make colored light and how that uh, devised an equation to dis uh, explain that or describe it. And that was the beginnings of quantum mechanics. Um, talk about how stars essentially all throughout the universe emit visible light. So no matter where you are in the universe, our eyes would likely work, even though we've evolved on this planet around this star of our own. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about vision. We talked about how our eye works, how it focuses different colors of lights at different points, different depths, uh, respected for our eye, which makes it hard to read. Um, here's a little diagram of that. We talked about the cone and rod cells in your eyes. The light comes in, on, according to this slide, from the bottom and then uh, goes through the mostly transparent cells to these stacked layers of uh, photoreceptors that have opsins in them. And we talked about uh, the way that nerve cells are on the surface of the retina as well as blood vessels. And uh, you've got a fovea in your eye. Thank you, Joanne, for helping me pronounce that correctly. Fovea in your eye, that's a spot where you see the densest distribution of those. Uh, here's the, uh, the human eye's response to color. We've got three different color receptor cells that uh, essentially concentrate on red, green, and blue. And this is what one of those opsin uh, proteins looks like, that looks like that is uh, photoreceptive. Uh, here's another graph of the responsiveness of the cells. The dotted line is the uh, rod cells that are not color sensitive, but just general light sensitive. Um, and then we talk about how uh, eyes have evolved over time. We talk about how uh, it's, in fact, a reducible complexity, not an irreducible complexity, like some people have claimed. Uh, how there are, there's a photosensitive spot or patch on an organism, and over time, uh, the laws of physics and optics combine with natural selection to optimize the functionality of that patch. And eventually, after a few different stages that we can see uh, recapitulated in organisms to this day, including this wonderful single cell protist that Joanne called my attention to, uh, Eugelina, right? Eugelina. Eugelina. Uh, it's got a wonderful, uh, it's got a little bit of pigment here. And then the light passes through this pigment and hits a photosensitive area. And this is all in a single cell. Pretty amazing creature. We talk about early eyes, like on this trilobite. Um, this is an example of a particular kind of trilobite bite eye. Uh, we talked about uh, sea stars and the human eye and the, the lens in our eye and how it's formed with concentric layers of transparent proteins. Now we talked about uh, a little bit about uh, different animals and some interesting things about other animal eyes, like this creature's eyes are bigger than its brain. Um, Huh. I don't know what's happening here. Okay, and we talk about spider eyes or compound eyes, which are common in insects. Uh, here's how big a human eye would have to be um, if it were a compound eye to have a similar visual acuity to our called camera eyes, the eyes that we actually have. If instead we had compound eyes, it'd have to be at least that big. Uh, we talked a little bit about fish eyes, how they could move the lens back and forth instead of just squishing it. Uh, and uh, <coughs> different mollusks, especially uh, squid and octopi, how they evolved a completely separate kind of eye, structurally different than humans. And then we talked about reflecting telescopes that are the kinds of eyes for a sea scallop. We talked about why animals eyes sometimes glow. That's because there's an actual mirror, a mirror layer behind the retina that reflects light back through the retina to give it a second chance. Uh, bird eyes. Bird eyes are barrel shaped, so birds can't move their eyes. That's why they move their heads to look around. And the amazing mantis shrimp um, has many different photoreceptors. This is the photoreceptor response of the different photoreceptors in a mantis shrimp eye. But if you compare that to the neurological response in a primate eye, I think this is from a monkey, 
uh, you see that the wavelengths that a primate eye is receptive to is similar, but the primate eye does it through computational power in its brain rather than just pure physical optical power in the shrimp. Shrimps don't have uh, that particular uh, creature doesn't have a very com complicated brain. All right, uh, then we talked about color in nature. Um, maple leaves uh, in the fall, maple trees produce another kind of pigment, another kind of sugar, and that's why uh, the leaves become a vivid red. Um, some of the green color that you see in leaves is reabsorbed by trees before they lose their leaves because that's a very chemically and energy intensive process to make those photosensitive chemicals, so they're reabsorbed. Um, generally speaking, about pigments, so here we are. This is where we are, this is where we left, walk, left off last time. <clears throat> if you see reds and browns and yellows in nature, and occasionally greens, those are made through pigments. Um, we can also use pigments found in nature to make paints. This is the oldest painting ever uh, so far discovered by a human being. It's from about 24,000 BC and uh, used red ochre and carbon black burnt wood, etc. These are the outlines of the hands of somebody who lived 24,000 years ago. Uh, one of the most colorful festivals that happens on the planet to this day is the Holi Festival in India. Beautiful <coughs> pigments are for, for sale in marketplaces. Um, we talked about, uh, we haven't talked about it yet, Tyrian purple. Uh, Tyrian purple was valued um, in the ancient world. It was the purple of kings and emperors. Uh, it was a very labor-intensive process to extract this purple from these mollusks that live in the Mediterranean area. It may have been used by Phoenicians as early as 1,500 BC. Um, this is considered the first modern pigment synthesized from uh, chemical bases. This is uh, Prussian blue, and this is its color. Um, it is a color that features prominently in this famous painting by the Japanese artist Katsu Ishika Haokasi. I'm saying that right. Haokasi. But there was a blue pigment that was devised long before that, a beautiful color called Egyptian blue, that features prominently in much of the artifacts and tomb paintings, etc., left by the Egyptians. So all of these are examples of pigments. Uh, and again, in nature, me uh, melanin and uh, uh, related pigments in animals generally express browns and yellows and occasionally reds and blacks. But there's another way to produce color. It's the way that you see when you look at a compact disc and you see the light reflected off of it in different colors. And that's a diffraction pattern. It tends to be more vivid and iridescent in its coloration. Nature takes advantage of that same property with certain uh, gemstones. You can see that same kind of iridescence. And in um, butterfly and insect wings and beetle cases and other things, uh, other living beings in nature use that same kind of diffraction grating mechanism to produce what's called structural color. So rather than color based on pigmentation, it's color based on structure, microscopic structure, and the way it interacts with light. Uh, chameleons, generally, they use structural colors um, when they change colors, but other things like uh, octopus and squid and cuttlefish, they use more of a pigment-based system. Birds, generally, you may not believe me when I tell you this, but peacock feathers are brown. And the way that they look iridescently blue and green is because of the structural properties of tiny microscopic plates of cells arranged in the feathers. <clears throat> Nature has selected for making this iridescent color, but it arises because of the structural nature of the cells. Uh, hummingbirds are famous for having iridescent colors. Again, it's uh, different layers of uh, plates of cells with different uh, structural components. It gives rise to very iridescent colors. 
same kind of thing in uh, blue blue jays. Nearly any time you see blue in a living creature, it's because of structural color, not pigmentation. Remember, pigmentation browns and yellows, sometimes greens, uh, reds. This is the most vivid color produced by any natural object so far as it's been discovered. It's a small African berry. Um, it's, com it's essentially bland, flavorless. But apparently what evolution has done is it has made it such a visually tempting target so that birds still eat it. So this is a, just a beautiful iridescent blue on this, uh, on this flower, or this berry. Uh, here's another example of structural color zooming in on a butterfly's wing. You see the wing, and then you see the individual plates. And if you look at a microscopic layer, you see essentially a diffraction grating. And for the first time, human beings have taken advantage of that process to create a color that can be applied to objects. Uh, the Lexus Car Corporation, which is actually Toyota, has produced a blue paint called Structural Blue. It's the most vivid and iridescent blue that has uh, ever existed on, a, on an object as a, uh, as a paint. Uh, finally, wrapping up about how do zebras get their stripes, there's this wonderful equation. Um, those of you who can solve it in your head can figure out how the zebra got its stripes. <clears throat> this was made by Alan Turing, a uh, famous British scientist who also was um, um, very important for cracking the code of the Nazis and was later prosecuted, persecuted, sorry, persecuted and prosecuted for being a homosexual. Uh, but he devised this color that relates uh, pigment flow to time and uh, by putting in different values for, for constants that come out of this equation uh, about rates of flow, he can re this equation can help reproduce a lot of the patterns seen in living things. Here's some of the books I used to create the content for this presentation. And that wraps up color and pigmentation. Thank you very much. All right, um, I'm going to have to change out my slides, so uh, I'll be right back. Um, now I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about alien beings. The particular question is uh, related to a field called xenobiology, scientists who study alien life, as you might imagine. Uh, they don't have a lot of experimental samples to work with. In fact, as far as we know, they have none. Um, but they do a lot of thinking. And some of their thinking is really quite um, extraordinary extrapolations about uh, biology, especially the rules of natural selection, which it's quite reasonable to suppose is a universal mechanism, as well as uh, fundamental laws of physics. So today, I want to convey to you some of the extrapolations that they've made about alien creatures, and uh, we'll discover what we can plausibly, plausibly <coughs> conclude about the structure form and function of alien extraterrestrial <laughs> beings. All right, um, first, setting the stage. It begins with a star, right, when uh, gas and dust clouds out in the universe coalesce to form stars. Oftentimes, they also form planets, and planets are comprised of silicates and metals and many other materials, part of the same 91 or 93, depending on what you count and why, uh, naturally occurring elements in nature. The same kinds of elements we see around us every day, uh, silicon and carbon and iron, nitrogen, sulfur, those same kinds of materials are spread ubiquitously throughout the universe and one of the things that causes those materials to be spread throughout the universe are events that occur around stellar death. When stars, some stars, when they die, they uh, explode catastrophically and they seed space with all kinds of heavy elements beyond hydrogen and helium. Here's a wonderful periodic table depiction. This is my favorite periodic table. I, I don't tend to be a chemistry guy, but I. I love uh, physics and astrophysics, 
And this table helps you discern the origin, the cosmic origin of many of the elements in our universe. And you can see that some of them come from uh, uh, different stars, dying low mass stars. Um, one of the more exciting ones in terms of recent discoveries with uh, gravity wave astronomy is merging neutron stars, that's the purple. Look how common that process is for some of the heavier elements in the periodic table. It also speaks to why things like gold and silver are rare, because they come from colliding neutron stars. And that's not something that happens in your backyard every day. So when stars explode, they populate space with these elements. Here's a depiction of the elements and their abundances. I'll zoom into it so you can see it a little better. You can see here that a lot of the elements that are relevant to complex chemistry, so they can form chains, long chains, polymers, for example, um, require carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and you see that those elements are relatively abundant in the cosmos. So what does it take? Once you have these planets, once you have these elements, what does it take for life to arise? Well, Mike did a talk a year or so ago, and I did a talk two or three years ago about theories regarding abiogenesis, theories about how life could have arisen from purely geologic and non-biologic processes, physical processes, mineral chemistry, etc. But to sum that up, if you've got air and energy and water and very possibly dry land, then you very likely have a context where life can arise. One of the reasons scientists tend to be optimistic about the plausibility of life arising elsewhere in the universe is that it happened, relatively speaking, quite quickly here on Earth. Within, within 500 million years of Earth coalescing out of the pre-solar nebula and all the rocks and minerals coming together to make Earth, within about 500 million years of that, it's plausible that life first arose on our planet. And it was not a very, what we would consider, hospitable environment. Well, that causes one of the challenges for figuring out the origin of life <laughs> questions, because the context or the stage that existed then was much different than what we see now. Things like oxygen wafting around in our atmosphere, um, that wouldn't have been common back in that Hadean period. It's called Hadean when uh, bombardments were frequent and whatnot. Another interesting thing is about the moon. The moon was about 25,000 miles away rather than uh, 300,000 miles or so. So the moon was much larger in the sky and also created much larger tidal phenomena and might have had other uh, uh, effects on Earth in terms of squeezing it and releasing heat and whatnot. But putting all the details aside, generally speaking, if you've got air, energy, water, and dry land, and certainly a, a nice, nice mix of chemical elements, then life can arise. So we can dispense with that idea. So what are things that are nice to have, maybe to the point where they must exist? This is where you start getting into more speculative territory, because we only have one example of a planet with life on it. So we can't for certain say what was necessary and what was just nice to have in terms of the particular environment of Earth. But a magnetic field was plausibly very useful, um, although recent studies have shown that uh, even without a magnetic field, uh, uh, rays from the sun can ionize the upper atmosphere, and that ionization shield can also protect from certain of the damaging radiation uh, potentially from a star or from the sun. So it may be that a magnetic field is not incredibly um, necessary. But a moon may be, remember I talked just now about a moon and how it was different on the, uh, in the context of the early Earth. Um, it may be that tidal pools that got wet and dry and wet and dry and had a big had a kind of uh, chemical broth in them, it may be that uh, tides and tidal action was very relevant to the origin of life on our planet. We don't know for sure. One thing that is uh, hotly debated, uh, I tend to 
not that I'm an expert in any of this, but I, I, I believe in the plausibility of the importance of plate tectonics to recycle carbon and other elements through the Earth's crust uh, and mantle, and even uh, linking with oceanic and atmospheric uh, processes. Uh, recently, it was discovered that the uh, plate tectonics and subduction zones uh, bury a lot more water than was previously thought. So water may actually lubricate plate tectonics to a certain degree. And the ratio between water versus uh, land material, that may be a critical factor in de determining whether you can have a biosphere that has uh, long-term sustainability. Another thing about the moon is, um, you've all heard, many of you have heard me talk about this before, when the moon was formed, it likely is the detritus from a collision event between Earth, a proto-Earth, and a Mars-sized planetismal. And a lot of what would correspond to Earth's crust got sloughed off and created the moon. So our crust is a lot thinner than it might otherwise be. So maybe that's what allows plate tectonics to happen. Uh, Venus and Mars don't have plate tectonics. Another thing that's uh, at least nice to have, if not absolutely a requirement, is not orbiting a red dwarf star. Some of you have heard about planets discovered around Proxima Centauri, the closest uh, star to Earth. Um, one of the problems, well, first, the good things about red dwarf stars is that they can last for uh, perhaps a trillion years. Very long lived stars, putting out copious amounts of energy for a trillion years. So it would be a good place for evolution to get going and uh, for a planet to have a constant energy supply. However, the bad thing is they tend to be very convective. They've got a lot of churning and frothing going on in them, and that causes tremendous stellar flares, or what we might call a solar flare, and those are correlated with tremendous uh, bursts of ultraviolet and x-ray energy, which can be uh, quite sterilizing to any biology that we are aware of. All right, what is life? That's a difficult question to answer, so I'm not going to. Um, but I can tell you some things that are at least requirements for life, some high-level um, properties that life continuously has. One is information, another is structure, and the third is metabolism. At the union of those uh, domains, as it were, in this Venn diagram, at the union of structure, information, and metabolism, life is possible. Life is also something that uh, uh, NASA has said must be capable of undergoing Darwinian selection. So one of the more interesting things that has happened in the history of life on Earth was the formation of complex cells. They're called eukaryotes. They are distinct from bacteria and uh, related uh, cells called archaea. And Lynn Margulis and a few other biologists have speculated that what happened to form the first complex cells was uh, symbiosis events where organelles, what have turned out to be organelles in complex cells today began life as free-floating bacteria or archaea and they came together non-destructively to form these uh, cellular communities. And uh, so once we had complex cells on Earth, for the first time in billions of years, sometime about 600 million years ago, multicellular life began to, uh, to evolve on our planet. After many billions of years of life being nothing but bacteria and archaea, so if life originated after only a few hundred million years from a chemical soup, but it took billions of years for a complex cell to evolve from that, then maybe that's an implausible or highly, um, a very rare event, statistically speaking. Again, we only have one sample, so we don't know. But once we have complex cells, and multicellular organisms, then we're off to the races in terms of what nature can do uh, with natural selection. In general, uh, we have two different body plans that nature has evolved for complex organisms. The sac body plan is one, 
And the other one is a tube within a tube. <laughs> this is a cross section of a worm, so it's got a digestive tract going through the center of it here. And then outside of it, it's got other organs, um, muscles, <laughs> circulatory systems, and whatnot. And if you look at every, um, every vertebrae, every chordata, everything with a, with a uh, spinal cord or a backbone, um, from worms on up in the evolutionary tangle of life on Earth, you find that this tube within a tube is a pretty good way to characterize complex life on Earth, you know, complex animals on Earth. And in a way, we're all worms, right? We're all, the, we're all tubes within a tube. Uh, one of the great inventions of the worm, they often go unheralded, is the head. Worms um, evolved a capability to have the eating part on one end of their body, typically the part of the body that moves forward. And then they've got the uh, other end, uh, bringing up the rear. <clears throat> and these two inventions are reasonable outcomes of a tube body plan. Now, what, how is it that we can get tubes? What, what laws of nature make tubes likely? Well, let's think about three-dimensional space. One of the aspects of three-dimensional space that's germane to this topic is that you can only move in one direction at a time. Now, I could certainly move parts of my body in different directions at the same time, but in terms of my entire organism, I can only move forward and back, side to side, etc. I can only, and you can only, and everything can only move in one direction at a time. So that directionality imposes a kind of favoritism if you're an organism trying to interact with your environment. It's reasonable that your feeding apparatus is pointed in the direction of motion. It's reasonable that your, many of your sensory apparatus are accumulated in the direction of motion. Smelling, hearing, seeing, tasting, many of those senses are accumulated so that you can see what's coming as opposed to what you already passed. So just by the virtue of the physical fact that we can only move in one direction at a time, that imposes a kind of directionality into the evolution of life, and hence the tube having a front end and a back end. Interestingly enough, in biology, there's this idea of convergent evolution, where similar environmental constraints, like living in water, give rise to similar physical properties. And this is an important consideration when talking about uh, speculations around exobiology, what the biology of different creatures on different worlds may be like. Physics is physics. Fluids are fluids. Planets create gravitational gradients. And these gravitational gradients help us distinguish between up and down. Things fall in a certain direction consistently. So life should naturally evolve a capability to deal with living in a gravitational gradient, where up is different than down, where one direction leads to the surface of the water and one direction leads to the depths. One direction gets you closer to the light, one direction gets you further into the darkness. So an up and down directionality is also a feature that we would expect to see manifested by the evolved body plans of life on other planets. And then what about the third dimension? Well, that one we can sort of ignore because it doesn't matter whether you turn right or you turn left, right? Well, one of the implications of that is why not just do the same thing on both sides of your body? Why not have bilateral symmetry? There's no physical characteristic on our planet, in our environment, generally speaking, that distinguishes between right and left. So organisms, quite plausibly, should be bilaterally symmetric, with a head and a tail and an up and a down. Right? That should be true no matter where you are in the universe. Let's talk about something else that's uh, nice to have if you're going to evolve into an intelligent beast. Well, 
One of the things that's really nice to have is the ability to manipulate your environment. So nearly every intelligent thing that we know of on our planet has some mechanism for manipulating its environment. Um, this squid, for example, has tentacles. So nearly all intelligent beings have most likely some sort of tentacle. This allows them to manipulate their environment. Uh, these things have been found to be able to escape mazes. Uh, interestingly enough, when they're put into a maze, they get bored rapidly, the same maze that a mouse would go in. So you put a squid or an octopus in a maze, and they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, OK, I'm tired of that. So they can't rerun it again and again. Uh, they, seem, they seem to have a, um, a state of boredom. Pretty interesting creatures. Another interesting tentacle is the trunk on an elephant. So the trunk on an elephant can manipulate its environment. Elements, uh, elephants have been known to throw rocks at people in zoos, for example. And uh, it's, a, it's a highly evolved means of interacting with their environment. And then human beings, our tentacles are uh, sort of fractured into different parts. We have our arms and our legs, and then we've got these wonderful tentacles at the end of our arms that are quite, um, as I say, dexterous. So tentacles to interact with and manipulate one's environment is a plausible characteristic of an intelligent or at least technologically competent organism. Right? Let's think about dolphins. Dolphins may have a language. They may have social skills. They may be highly intelligent, but they don't have appendages that allow them to manipulate their environment. So it's unlikely that a species that evolved on our planet or any other planet with a convergent evolution consistent with being adapted to a fluid environment, remember that convergent evolution, it's unlikely that something that adapted to that environment would uh, develop a body plan that could manipulate its environment. Although a mollusk is an example of a way that that can happen. So maybe it's plausible. And we'll talk more about underwater intelligent life in a moment. One of the things I want to talk about as a slight diversion is these, uh, this idea that I got from uh, one of the books that I read in preparation for this talk. And in this book called The Cosmic Zoo, the authors distinguish between something called a critical path and a couple of other uh, ways to traverse through the, uh, the evolutionary um, options available to an organism or even a chemical uh, as it evolves to do certain things. Um, the critical path. There's one way a thing must occur. And given the right conditions, it always will. For example, here's a non-biological example. Planets are round. Stars are round. Once you get to a specific critical mass within an astronomical body, gravity takes over and imposes a round shape on them. Similarly, you can imagine processes in biology that creates a critical path. There's one thing that must occur and given one condi given the right conditions, it always will. For example, having a head and a tail, or a top end and a bottom end, right? Um, having your sensory apparatuses accumulated on something that corresponds to your direction of motion, right? That's just the imposition of the laws of physics. Uh, refracted through the lens of biology. So that might be critical path kinds of evolutionary characteristics. Then there are many path uh, possibilities. Eyes are a good example of that. As we mentioned last week, as we talked about last week, and as I um, uh, covered briefly again today, there are many different ways and times that eyes have evolved in the animal kingdom. But photons are ubiquitous and the benefits of being able to see are pretty evident. So having many different paths that, are, that all provide an eye is a reasonable evolutionary um, set of journeys. And then we have what are called random walk events. 
Random walk events are things that are highly contingent. They might have happened or they might not have happened. And one of the examples that I've already talked about is the formation of complex cells or eukaryotes. If the formation of eukaryotes, eukaryotic cells, complex cells, if that's a very rare chance occurrence, then we can expect that complex life might be very rare in our universe even if the conditions for the formation of life are fairly ubiquitous. If eukaryotic life, multicellular life, if those things are the result of some infinitesimally improbable random event, then maybe life, complex life is not uh, very common. On the other hand, maybe there's some merging between a critical path and a random walk for eukaryotic life such that if the conditions exist, so you've got individual microbes, trillions and trillions of them in an ecosystem, eventually they will come together in a symbiotic um, relationship and form a complex cell. Maybe that's the way it is. We don't know yet. We don't know whether complex life is a random walk rare event that just happened to occur, or whether it's uh, a many path event or a critical path event. But let's assume that life complex life can arise on other worlds fairly readily. What are some of the characteristics that we can plausibly imbue this life with? Well, one is the ability to see. As I talked about last time and a little bit today, light is ubiquitous in our universe. Every, nearly every star in the universe emits what we would call visible light. So if we've evolved to make advantage take advantage of this wonderful ambient um, uh, property of our universe, our local universe, that it's plausible that other beings on other worlds would evolve something similar. And it's also plausible that if they had really good visual acuity, the kind of acuity that requires, uh, that is required for um, uh, fine motor control, uh, making tools and um, uh, dealing with garments and needles and whatnot, that that kind of visual acuity will give rise to what, something similar to what we have with camera eyes. Our camera eyes are called camera eyes. A camera is a physical thing because it's the laws of physics and optics that's, that in large part dictate how our eyes must be shaped, how they must work. So those same laws must apply on other planets as well. So a sense of vision with uh, camera-like eyes of some sort is probably a characteristic of evolve intelligent life or involve complex life. The sense of smell arose before the sense of vision in the evolutionary tree. We are surrounded by all kinds of complicated molecules. Some of them are good for us, some of them are not good for us. Being able to distinguish between the yummy ones and the icky ones is important. So a sense of smell or some, that's the way, that's our psychological response is smelling but the physical characteristic of being able to chemically identify different molecules in your environment is uh, plausibly quite important. If you live on a planet with sufficient gravity to retain an atmosphere, that atmosphere is capable, I guarantee you, it is capable of carrying sound. So, so are liquids, right. Uh, so if you've got uh, an environment that is uh, a, a liquid um, uh, bio or, uh, biosphere or, and or an atmospheric one, then you're probably going to be capable of detecting and or emitting sounds. What are some things that are implausible about prospective alien beings? Well, one of the uh, scientists science fiction tropes that you may have come across is energy beings, right? Well, in order for energy to be relevant to the functioning of structure, information, and metabolism, you've got to have an energy flow. And energy flows and, ener and uh, structure and information that all entail the use of energy can only be manifest by physical objects, molecules, um, computers, uh, tinker toys that are built to calculate things, cranes that are built to move things, your arm 
has evolved to be able to move and manipulate things by exerting, uh, by expending energy. Everything about life, and in fact the physical world that allows physical objects to interact with other objects, entails the use of matter. So the idea of a pure energy being is just hogwash. Won't happen. Uh, you can't see this one very well, but this is a scene from Men in Black. And this is, uh, this is a, bug, a giant bug-like creature. I want to talk about this for a couple of minutes. So, bugs can only get so big on our planet because of gravity. Right? If you try to walk around on the surface of the Earth as a bug, eventually the sort of two-dimensional uh, carapace or shell or uh, exoskeleton that supports the structure of your body, as your body grows according to the cube of the volume, the exoskeleton grows only in terms of surface area. So that's a squared term, x squared as opposed to x cubed. So at some point, as you're growing physically, um, you run out of physical, physics kind of uh, parameter space to be able to support a large body with an exoskeleton. It's one of the reasons that it's plausible and reasonable that endoskeletons have evolved to support creatures on Earth. Interestingly enough, once you talk about a dense fluid environment, some of those constraints are removed. We see crustaceans in the ocean that are much larger than insects on land. Because a flu buoyant fluid environment can allow you to overcome some of the deleterious effects that might otherwise exist due to gravity. There's another example of why um, fluid environments versus terrestrial environments put limits. One of the things about this uh, buggy creature here is that it's really big, right? So think about big science fiction creatures you may have encountered. King Kong, for example. Well, the same kind of physical scaling law that dictates how large an animal can be in its environment with a gravitational field also applies to things with endoskeletons. Right? The strength of your skeleton is uh, uh, largely due to the cross-sectional area of your bones. And that's one of the reasons that uh, birds can have uh, even hollow bones because they have very little <coughs> relative mass. But if you get something like an elephant, elephant has giant, thick bones. Well, if you continue extrapolating along that curve, as you get much larger than an elephant with a potential terrestrial being, the bones will get bigger than the organism itself. And of course, that won't fly, and, or, or walk, for that matter. So, in the history of life on Earth, whenever we see gigantic organisms, Typically, they have really big bones, and the largest organisms that have ever lived are in a buoyant environment. Great whales, certain dinosaurs. So, by being in a buoyant, fluid environment, you can overcome some of these limitations of gravity. So, what if a living thing evolved on a planet with a weak gravitational field? Maybe it wouldn't need to have such a strong skeleton whether it's an exoskeleton or an endoskeleton. Well, if such a being came to Earth, they would immediately be crushed by our gravity, first of all. But even more importantly than that is the annoying fact that if you have a planet with a weak gravitational field, it's not likely to be able to hang on to its water and its air. So if you get a planet with a very weak gravitational field like like the moon, where you could bounce around, and, Mars. And, or Mars, right? Um, then, yeah, it could allow, from a physics standpoint, for larger body plans, but those body plans are likely to be contingent upon an available energy supply. And as far as we know, in biochemistry and in chemistry, I mean, we've only got 90-some elements to work with. The most energetic, some of the most energetic processes re rely on phosphorus and oxygen. Well, phosphorus is typically not a gas, am I right? And oxygen can be a gas, but you have to be able to hold it in in an atmosphere, and that means gravity. 
So there's this interplay between gravitational strength and the density of your atmosphere and the composition of your atmosphere. And that gravitational gradient is also implicated in the plausible shapes and structures of body plans. So we can talk about undersea life, like this wonderful little Casper the Ghost squid. But when we start thinking about technologically advanced undersea or underwater life, then it's hard to imagine a context in which a technologically advanced um, species could develop underwater. One of the things that's really important for us is fire. And I could go, I, I, you know, there's another talk uh, that, that's possible about the, the relevancy of fire to us. But one of the things is being able to cook our food gives us a much, um, a much bigger head start on digesting our food compared to many animals that eat their food raw. So cooking our food as human beings has allowed us to expend less energy and less real estate in our bodies to digestion than many other animals. So cooking is important. It allowed us plausibly to have bigger brains, more complex behaviors. But you can't cook without heat. Well, maybe an undersea creature could cook its food on a geothermal vent. But then you get into the problem of, even if that's plausible, how do you make tools? How can you chip a flint? If you've ever tried to move underwater, it's hard to get up to speed with something large like a, like a hand or a tool to be able to go fast enough to chip rocks and make simple tools. So I believe, this is a belief I have, there's no evidence about this, but I'm persuaded by the scientific evidence of things on our planet, that it is implausible to speculate that there will be an undersea technologically advanced civilization that arises through natural selection. Let's talk a little bit about brains. Brains are generally proximal to sensory organs. You want to have a short signal path from, what's that, to, oh heck. <laughs> right? So having a short path from a sensory apparatus to the brain is important. Um, It'll likely be in the head with the mouth, right? Remember, that's your direction of motion. That's likely to be where your senses are. And your senses are likely to want a short path to your brain. So all of this taken together justifies a plausible speculation that intelligent creatures will have centralized brains with sensory apparatus collapsed around them. And also that, it, that that apparatus will be somewhat flexible so that it can look around in its environment. Um, neurons concentrated rather than distributed, processing speed influenced by gravity. This is not something I read, this is uh, one of my own speculations, that in order to be able to catch a ball or chase any running beast on our planet, those beasts will be um, behaving in a way that is consistent with the strength of gravity on our planet, right? The speed with which you walk, you're essentially falling forward every step you take, and the rate at which you fall is predicated on the strength of gravity. If you catch something that's thrown or something that's falling, the, the speed with which that trajectory is, uh, is traversed is dependent in large part on, this, on the, the characteristics of gravity on our planet. So one of my speculations is that the speed of cognition, how rapidly we think, is tied to the strength of gravity. Um, we probably evolved as carnivores um, for various reasons. Carnivores generally are uh, favored with stereoscopic vision. We tend to have a more calorie-rich uh, diet, etc. So they're likely to be carnivores with big brains, sensory apparatuses, and mouths for feeding. I'm not going to speculate about how they might communicate. Maybe they'll use radio waves. I don't know. Maybe they'll flap things that are separate sound emitters rather than the mouths we have. But there are all kinds of fun speculations. Once we've gotten that far, we can speculate about bipedalism or quadrupeds. Maybe there are hexapods or octopods, right? Bilateral symmetry is reasonable, but it's hard to think of a physical limitation that 
means that we only have four limbs. Why not six or eight? If it's bilater bilaterally symmetric, it's probably going to be an even number. But then you have things like uh, squid and elephants that only have one tentacle or maybe an odd number. So it's not necessarily true that they will be quadruped. Environmental factors that would likely change our physiology and the path of evolution fairly significantly. Uh, night and day cycles. What if we lived on a planet that continuously faced its star? So that it was always daytime on one side and always night on another. How would that impact evolution? And those, these are the kinds of fun things to speculate if you want to write a science fiction book. What about seasons? The fact that our Earth is tilted and we have seasons, and we have trees that shed their leaves, and we have bears that hibernate, and we have migratory, great migratory movements uh, in our oceans and across our lands. What would it be like to evolve on a planet without seasons or with much more pronounced seasons? The strength of gravity, I've already mentioned that. One of the frustrating limitations about a human brain is that we're not very smart. You can imagine being smarter than we are. You can imagine the average IQ being much greater than it is. That a, 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 a capacity for critical thinking might be more highly evolved rather than something we have to acquire through effort. You can imagine that being able to memorize a list of a thousand things could be useful in a complex society. No, certainly our long-term memories are great at that. We've memorized thousands upon thousands of words. But our short-term working memory, for most people, is about seven chunks big. And there's all kinds of things we can talk about about how you can do chunking more effectively. But what if something had a short-term working memory that was 10,000 chunks big? What if you could look at a, at a set of scattered objects and say, oh, there are 900, 947 of them right there. What if you just glance at something and know that? Right? So there's a lot of potentiality for brains to be more competent than ours. Not to belittle our capabilities. We are amazing creatures. But I don't know of any physics rules that put limits on much of that, except the birth canal and our brain size and all of that. So um, maybe there's this trade-off between functionality and physical size that every creature would have to contend with. Uh, issues of aggression and intelligence, right? We tend to be aggressive creatures. We tend to have this, this constant push and pull between short-term pleasure and demands on our attention versus long-term goals and um, selfishness versus altruism, etc. You can imagine contexts in other worlds that might give rise to a different set of social and psychological phenomena for other beings. So we have no idea whatsoever how common or uncommon intelligent beings might be in our cosmos of 200 billion galaxies. But we can say that aliens likely have eyes, mouths, brains, heads, voices, probably bilateral symmetry, and some means of smelling and hearing. They will likely be evolved from carnivores and have stereoscopic vision. They will probably be warm-blooded because of the energy benefits of that. They will have evolved on a planet with plants, animals, viruses, and bacteria, simpler life, and more complex life. They're probably not significantly larger nor smaller than us due to the laws of physics and limits on skeletal uh, construction, on body construction, and uh, the laws of gravity. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about, if the gravity of a planet is too significant, too large, then you're going to retain an atmosphere of uh, hydrogen and helium, a very thick atmosphere like Neptune and Uranus and uh, Saturn, etc. And it's hard to imagine how the atmospheric pressures and other physical characteristics of that kind of environment would create an environment conducive to the evolution of life. Alien beings, if they exist, will likely think symbolically and be able to make tools, vehicles, telescopes, and such. They will evolve on a planet with finite land, 
finite food, dry land, and mortal hazards. So a system of economics and trade is likely to be in their heritage. They will probably be pulled between curiosity and caution due to the competing survival benefits of these dispositions. They will likely have the same psychological polarity of motivation that humans have between short and long-term benefits between selfishness and altruism. We don't know if they'll hibernate, whether they'll have skin or scales, whether they'll have hairy bodies or smooth. We don't know if they'll have bright colors or dim, or whether they'll have camouflage capabilities. Will they be more or less prone to violence, to critical thinking, and to compassion? Will they be smarter? How will they care for one another and for their planets? Will we ever get a chance to meet them? One of the things that some people have speculated is a plausibility in our own future is that we will move away from being biological beings dependent upon Darwinian evolution and might be instead the harbingers of constructed beings, artificial intelligences, although I have a problem with the term artificial applied to a sentient being. Um, but they may be constructed beings. They may be powered by nuclear energy or electrical energy or solar energy. Some combination of non nanotechnology, biology, and macro technology might allow us to create living, thinking, interacting beings that are not bound by the constraints of a planet. They can escape some of the physical constraints of biology. Maybe those things exist. We just don't know. These are a couple of the books that I've used to inform some of the content of this presentation. And here's a couple more of the books. Yes. Mike, will you click on yes? Yes. yes. Thank you. All right. And then you can, uh, I'll, I'll save it. All right, so that's that. Questions? Oh. Yeah, I, I didn't mention it because even protists, um, you know, simple organisms can generally sense whenever there's something very close to them or touching them. That's probably the first sense to evolve. It's debatable whether that sense or a, a chemical sensing sense came first. But yeah, the sense of touch is likely. Uh, you certainly can't manipulate your environment without a sense of physical touch. Scott, I was wondering about carbon-based uh, forms or just yeah. other, other options? The only other option I've heard of is silicon based. Yeah, so the chemists in the crowd can probably speak to this more intelligently than I, but from what I've garnered, uh, you can make polymers from silicon, um, silica gels and plastics and whatnot, uh, certain sorts, but they don't tend to be as chemically gregarious as carbon based molecules and carbon based. Um, processes. Uh, silicon is a poor understudy for carbon, is one way to think of it. But carbon is everywhere. Even stars as simple as our sun, which aren't going to be supernovas, it's just a regular run-of-the-mill, boring, everyday kind of star. Even our kind of star makes carbon. Carbon and oxygen and nitrogen are just everywhere in the cosmos. So because they're such gregarious, chemically um, uh, I don't know. Reactive, reactive thank you. This <clears throat> word that was saving my mind. Chemically reactive atoms. Um, let's just let's just use them. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. It's everywhere. And it makes perfect sense. Other questions? There was recently an article about the driest place on Earth in the in five hundred years and the rain came and Killing this bizarre life in the middle of the water. So, is water the essential life? Yes. Um, even the ectoplasm, the, the endoplasm in those cells, um, needs water. Uh, 
water has several chemical and physical characteristics that make it a unique compound in the universe. Uh, it's a polar molecule that's got a slight positive and a slight negative side, so it makes a fantastic solvent. Also, crystals of water tend to arrange themselves in a configuration physically that's less dense than the liquid form. Hardly anything else does that. So it allows oceans to freeze over and preserve an aqueous environment underneath. Um, and then if you look at the, the um, microbiology and molecular biology of a lot of the processes that happen in cells, water is a necessary chemical ingredient or a product of those. Even motion, uh, when you're looking at the, the proton pumps and the mitochondria of our cells, um, one of the things that's implicated is the, the random thermal motion of water molecules and some of that. So water is necessary, but, it, but you can also drown. And you can think of what's happening in the Atacama Desert as being those organisms are drowning. It's just too much water compared to the amount of water they need from the way they've evolved. Yeah, you can over water plants. Uh, the, um, Hello. Hi. Okay. The, um, within, when she happened in, I can't believe it was in 47 with the Roswell incident. Has anybody speculated about that? Oh, lots of people are speculating about that. <laughs> um, um, that seems to be um, a current thing. Um, <coughs> uh, accumulated from Roswell is your cell phone that everybody and all that technology um, that we're going to work in the fifth dimension. Well, you have to be you have to be careful about not underselling the capability for creativity and invention of human beings, right? <laughs> Cell phones you can trace a direct lineage back to the transistor, and we know who invented the transistor and how they did it, right? They didn't uh, they did it from scratch. Um, Roswell, and let's expand the topic of <laughs> UFO sightings in general, or even this Oma, uh, Oumuamua, this object that recently has uh, zoomed through our, our solar system. There's a Harvard scientist who said, well, maybe it's an alien probe. Oh my God, the press went crazy, right? He should not have done that. Well, I don't know. Free speculation, it's a free society, right? But space is really big. It is really, really big, and it takes a really long time to get from here to there. Even to the closest star should take thousands of years for any kind of plausible propulsion mechanism. And it's really hard to imagine how a biological organism could traverse that space, first of all. And secondly, how they could have possibly known to set off several thousand years ago before we were emitting radio waves or anything interesting. I think it's implausible that alien beings have visited the Earth. I think it is quite plausible that alien intelligent beings exist somewhere. All right. Other questions? About a hundred.
I wish I could answer that. Yeah, the, the question is about the lifespan of a civilization, especially a technological civilization. You know, one of the things that I was hinting at with my last slide, uh, my next to the last slide about the prospective characteristics of alien beings is that they're likely predators. They're likely to have evolved on a planet with limited resources, limited food, competition, right? So it's hard to imagine, even from a sociology standpoint, how things could be vastly different. You know, we saw this movie Pan, about Pandaria, Pandora, or whatever, you know, right? And on this planet, you know, everybody loves everybody, and the ecosystem is in perfect perpetual balance and whatnot. Kind of the, the noble savage idea, which is significantly outdated from a philosophical and sociological and anthropological perspective on Earth. And I personally wonder whether any sufficiently competent intellectual and technological beings could have evolved in a circumstance that led to no competition or less competition or no wars, no tendency to hate each other and compete with each other in moral combat. I don't, we only have a sample of one, really, human species. So I don't know that anybody has an answer to that, but I think we can think hard about it. And how long will a civilization last? I don't know. We don't just have to worry about technological bugaboos like nuclear weapons and manufactured viruses. We also have to worry about things like uh, giant tsunamis and giant asteroid impacts and tremendous solar flares, things that are... I'm sorry? Volcanism. Right, uh, volcanism. The Yellowstone crater. Going right. Yeah. So it's not just our own devices that we are mortally threatened by, but just the process of living in a dy dynamic world in a dynamic universe. So I, I don't know. Hopefully it's long enough to get out there where it's safer in the dark between the stars. It's a fascinating prospect. You, you tend to, in, in one aspect, when I think about it, I focus in on saying, these are the constrictions, these are the things that focus us in towards staying along this path and people or, or species from somewhere else focusing in on a similar path, then you start saying with just slight differences of different levels of gravitational uh, fields or different levels of oxygenation or whatever is, is their combustion technique for gaining energy, they could be very much more active than us, they could be very yeah. much more sedentary than us. There's so many possibilities arise. That reminds me of a trope that I often have encountered in my life. Yeah, you've probably read about it too. Well, if alien beings were to find us, it'd be like us finding a bug, right? We would just be unnoticeable and irrelevant to any sufficiently advanced alien society. I think that's poppycock, right? Where else on the planet can you see things building, intentionally creating structures that emit light, that move around, under our control, if you get a technological species, I don't care how advanced our brains are, how many, how many slots are in our short-term working memory, how large our IQ is, what, how limited or expansive is our tendency towards empathy. We can at least recognize the constructs of an advanced civilization when we come across it. They're never going to be beneath our notice or anything else's notice. I'm sorry? It'll be a wild woman. Yeah, it'll be a wild woman. Yeah. All right, I have a couple of questions. Sure. About like kind of disturbing this idea. But isn't it the only thing is kind of trying to have a head, but I just try to have a smart thing, I just try to have a brain, and maybe a skull, like a deep brain state, and like, some sense where I can near it so I can, so I can like, um, because short signal the, you know, yeah. this between the, yeah. um, any reason why it's going to be like, um, right where it is, like on the top of things, or why it can not be somewhere else? Well, I think that my, my speculation about that, again, is that you want to have your sensory organs and your feeding tube pointed in the direction of motion which, you know, when we went from being quadrupeds 
and of all living bipeds, um, you know, we, we carry over that characteristic about pointing our sensory devices in our direction of motion and having them clustered around our feeding, our feeding hole, right? Because that's the part in evolutionary terms, if you think of a worm again, the, the feeding hole is the hole that encounters and is most interested in anthropomorphizing it most interested in interacting with its environment. So it makes sense that the sensory apparatus will be clustered around the feeding hole. Now the communicating apparatus may be completely different, right? It's just probably just coincidental that we use the same hole for speaking that we do for eating. And for your second question. Yeah, um, yeah, Fred, I was speculating my idea of you're on energy things. And, you know, So um, the, the books that I uh, referenced do talk a bit about that, about the distributed intelligence and whatnot. But interestingly enough, there's been no evidence that that kind of intelligence is adaptable or creative or able to solve um, novel problems. So like bees, bees can dance, and this was in one of the books I read, bees can dance quite well and that dance will tell you where a particular pollinated field is. But it won't tell you if another colony has already found it. It won't tell you whether it's hot or cold there. It won't tell you about how, how strong the wind is blowing on your way there. Right? There's all kinds of information that might be interesting that has never been able, uh, never been encoded in the bee dance. So it seems that those kinds of capabilities in termites and ants and wasps and bees have evolved to solve very specific problems and they're not good at abstraction and probably not, I can't, I can't imagine an extrapolation of that to tool use and big creative brains or cognition. Simple creatures certainly can, can regrow and regenerate, and that gets into stem cells and all that. But I don't think any of that's directly germane to the overall physical structure of a plausible alien intelligence. John, any last question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it just occurred to me, I mean, isn't evolution driven by the environment? I mean, we've had five or six, what, five billion years. ecosystem and geology, it's not at all certain that intelligence will arise because of that. Right. You're going to, evolution is giving you an advantage or something else in your current environment. Right. And we don't even know if we're an, a highly adapted species. I mean, we've only been around for about 300,000 years. 
I mean, we're a flash in the pan in terms of evolutionary longevity of species. Maybe we're a dead end if we end up, right, uh, offing ourselves. All right, so I'll be around for another few minutes, and uh, I thank you all for coming today. Thank you talk about atmosphere, some of the stuff that we talked about here, which brought me some more ideas I'd like to uh, demonstrate with you about the atmosphere of our planet. So thanks for coming.